Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 270, recorded Monday, October 24th, 2016. Jerry Kaplan. Triangulation is brought to you by Optical Cables by Corning. Corning's incredibly durable Thunderbolt and USB 3-dot optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. And by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of Super Tank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the smartest, most interesting people in technology and uh, learn a little. We call it Triangulation because, well, it's, it's our guest, it's me, but it's also you in the chat room. If you can watch live, we'd love it if you do. Join us at irc.twit.tv and help me... Uh, direct this conversation. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Uh, Jerry Kaplan is a name you probably know if you're following uh, the amazing Silicon Valley story. He was the founder of one of the first tablet computers, uh, Go Computing. But even before that, I didn't know this. Welcome, Jerry Kaplan. It's great to have you. Thank you, Leo. Great to see you. When you did, uh, you did uh, a... Um, digital instrument called the Synergy in 1980 used by Wendy Carlos. For, oh, yes. That was a long time ago. For Tron. Yes, it was. Wow. It was. It's, not, it's interesting. I, I mean, I think of my friend, uh, David Friend, who uh, did the ARP synthesizer, Ray Kurzweil, mm -hmm. who did Kurzweil's. What is it about you AI guys and music? I don't know, but I'm still at it. I, um, I play uh, jazz piano at a restaurant in Half Moon Bay regularly now. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I think there's something it's it's a uh, it's um, there's something in the brain. A lot of programmers and, uh, and and scientists are musicians as well. It's it's mathematical in some ways. I I agree with that. I do think it's a very related uh, related set of skills. Yeah. Well, anyway, welcome. We're here uh, partly to talk about the new book. You have three now. This one's called Artificial Intelligence: What Everyone Needs to Know. About 20 years you chronicled you, ago, you chronicled your experiences uh, with Go in a book called Startup that is a, considered a classic of Silicon Valley literature. And, and last year, uh, a book that is a little scary, Humans Need Not Apply, uh, The Guide to Wealth and Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. AI, this is something you've always... We think of AI, especially the younger folks, I think, is uh, something new, as machine learning, as something Google and Microsoft and Apple are investing in. But this has been around for ages. That's true. Uh, the field really got its start in 1956 at a conference at Dartmouth University, which is uh, where the name artificial intelligence actually came from. It was, uh, I think, a workshop uh, for the study of uh, artificial intelligence. The title was something like that. And many of the famous names that if you're of a certain age, you would <laughs> know, uh, like John McCarthy and Marvin Minsky, uh, and a couple of other uh, very famous people, Claude Shannon, who people may know from historical work on uh, information theory. Uh, they all got together at Dartmouth uh, for summer and decided they were going to look into how to make machines how to program machines to engage in behavior that normally require human effort or attention. Yeah. Or attention. Yeah. Of course, Minsky just recently passed away. Mm -hmm. Yes. McCarthy, the founder of Creative Lisp. Uh, Correct. The language of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. there, artificial intelligence was the hot thing for a while. Um, I didn't realize it went back to 56, but... Uh, yes, it does. It's as old as I am. Uh, but uh, it went through a, a fallow period. We gave up, didn't we, on AI for some time? Well, the field has always motored along, but the public uh, awareness or image of the field has changed over time. And so it's gone through a series of cycles of being very much in vogue and then out of vogue and then in vogue again. And uh, the reasons for that are quite interesting. 
and not necessarily very uh, flattering for what goes on in the field or for the way these things are perceived by the public. Right now, we're in another one of these uh, hype cycles, and uh, it's, it's got some justification behind it. There's a tremendous amount of good work going on, mainly because of the area of machine learning. And what people today uh, who are entering the field, what they think of as artificial intelligence, is actually quite different than what people originally intended or thought the field was going to be about back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So, in fact, I, Wired Magazine just had an interview, uh, Joe Ito of the uh, MIT Media Lab with uh, President Obama, and I thought he made a very, uh, actually a very good point, the president of all people, right at the top, distinct, distinguishing specialized artificial intelligence with general AI. Absolutely. And he said, we've, you know, we all read science fiction and really are thinking of AI as this kind of general HAL 9000 device that we can converse with, play chess with, we'll, you know, be like a human. Uh, and that's quite a way off. Is that, is that accurate? Is that, is that something that is probably not, that we shouldn't be thinking of when we think of AI? Yeah, I, I'd like to distinguish two things. And the book kind of debunks a lot of the mythology about artificial intelligence precisely because of the point that, that you're making. There is no artificial general intelligence. This is merely an aspiration or an idea that you see in the movies and in the press. Uh, the rest of it is not really that way. The actual work that's going on is that we're applying some new software, software engineering techniques to uh, problems that are usually fairly specific or certain tasks. Now, the interesting thing about that is whenever we have a new task that we're able to solve, most recently, for example, playing the game of Go by a computer, um, what happens is people overinterpret that. They think, oh my God, the machines are getting smarter and smarter. But a sober view, if you really look at the technologies, that's not actually the case. The machines are not getting smarter. What it means is that we've done a great job of engineering uh, out of a tool bag of uh, techniques to, we've been able to apply them to solve some particular problem, in this case, playing a game of Go. Now, the problem is that people overinterpret that. This is what I call AI theater, and this has been going on since the 1950s and 60s, where you get these kind of magic shows, where there's usually some kind of little trick that fools people into overinterpreting what it is that they're seeing. And so people think, oh my God, the Terminator's coming, <laughs> or we're developing machines that are generally intelligent, and what are we gonna do when they decide they don't need us anymore? Yeah. Well, I don't worry about my toaster not needing me anymore, and I don't worry <laughs> about the systems that we're building with artificial intelligence not needing me anymore. This is not to say that there isn't progress taking place in the field. Yeah. There is progress. But it's, it's uh, in my view, the wrong way to think about the field that what we're doing is we're building increasingly intelligent machines. That just doesn't match what we're really seeing. What's happening is we're expanding the class of problems to which we can apply this new technology. So we, th we kind of tend to think of it as computers that think. It sounds like think isn't really the right term for this. I agree. I, I agree with myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might have said that in here. I might have, got, I might have I stolen that from you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, I think when we think, when we characterize it as thinking, that means one thing to the general public. Right. And it means something else to people in the computer field. We, we tend to anthropomorphize not just artificial intelligence systems, but computers in general. Oh, my computer is thinking about the problem. Oh, it's uh, hesitating. Oh, it's made a mistake. Oh, it's wrong. And um, we, we imbue it with uh, the way that children imbue dolls with this notion that there's a sentient being or somehow growing or arising within this device that is just an illusion. It, it's false. There's just no reason to believe that that's the case. There's real stuff going on. And it has real economic value and real consequences for society. But when we think of it as being intelligent, that's really 
not a very productive way. Yeah. Instead, as I explain in my book, it's a better way to think about it is that we're expanding the class of tasks that we can now automate. And the, the history of automation, of course, goes back many centuries. But we're looking at um, a new class of kinds of tasks that we're able to automate. And that's due to some very specific advances that have taken place in the field over the past couple of decades. You, you talk in the book about this Dartmouth conference in 1956, and you just mentioned the the, the big names uh, that were at it. There was even a kind of disagreement then about what computers could do, should do. Um, in fact, it looks like some of the some of the participants, McCarthy particularly, thought the computer could think, or at least could simulate human thought. Well, if you go back and you look at what was actually written back then. What you're saying is is correct. What you had was a set of people who were wildly over enthusiastic and they had a very particular idea of what it meant to be intelligent. And I can explain that uh, in a minute. But there was another group of people, mostly uh, philosophers and uh, sociologists and whatnot, that took offense yeah. at these overly broad claims and particularly the time frames in which these people thought that this kind of where their work was going to result in what you think today is uh, artificial general intelligence. And of course, it was completely debunked because we never did get there. You know, it wasn't in 1970, we didn't have these intelligent machines and robots running around like we saw in the movie anymore than we do today. So uh, it's true that that uh, the original view was they over oversold the field and worried everybody and that's part of what created the these cycles yeah you know you mentioned that uh it's almost a magic trick to that these uh, devices do that make us think they're actually thinking but I'm, I'm thinking back even farther to the what is it 19th or 17th 18th century the mechanical turk which was supposed to be a chess playing robot actually had a human and a small human inside <laughs> and and fooled all of europe uh, because they thought it was a machine that could play chess. We've 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 been looking for this for hundreds of years, and the notion that a machine could somehow be a simulacrum of humans is is not really new to the computer era. It's interesting. Alan Turing, uh, for instance, uh, thought about this. He, the Turing test. We often refer to this idea of the Turing test. That's not really. Is it something that uh, scientists studying AI actually consider an important test? No, absolutely not. It's kind and of that's a, a joke. Well, I'm not sure. I wouldn't exactly call it a joke, but it's not something that scientists, serious scientists, yeah. are taking seriously. It's it's a game. That's the better way to, to look at Good. it, rather than a joke. Yeah. Now, you make a really interesting point. The general public view of the Turing test and of what Turing said is not at all what Turing said. And if you go back and read his original paper, which, by the way, is very readable, I'm sure he just knocked it out over a weekend. I, I think it's called on the the uh, machine intelligence on machine intelligence. Uh, I forgot the exact title of his original paper. It was just kind of a thought piece about this. And if you read what he actually said, it was absolutely fascinating. And I cover this in detail in my book. Uh, he said that uh, to ask the question, "Can machines think?" is too meaningless to deserve discussion. But he went on to say, however, I do think that within 50 years, people will talk about machines as thinking without fear of contradiction. Mm. And what I believe he meant by that was he was talking about a shift in our use of words that at the time, if you said <clears throat> my computer is thinking, then uh, people would go, oh, that's crazy. What does that mean? Computers don't do that. They just calculate. Uh, but he was speculating that in 50 years' time, people would be much more comfortable using that kind of terminology to describe the behaviors that they were seeing with machines. And in that sense, he was entirely correct, because here we are 50 years later, and we talk about, you know, Siri is thinking about my question. So he was absolutely right about uh, this, but I don't think he believed that it had anything to do with the notion of uh, human intelligence. The pay the paper you're talking about, he published in a magazine called Mind in 1950. It was called um, Computing Machinery Intelligence. Um, okay. So sorry, what? So yeah. what did he posit as the Tur what, what? I know the Turing. We think of the Turing test as basically a conversation 
between a human and what may or may not be a machine. And if you can't tell the difference, if you can't identify the computer versus the human that you're talking to, then it's passed the Turing test. And you see headlines, even to this day, computer passes Turing test as if, you know, that really it was a milestone. But is that not, that's not what he proposed? Well, in a way, he didn't propose it as a test to see whether machines are intelligent. Okay. He posed it as a test of how far we could actually build something, and I'm not making this up, to fool people. Right. That was exactly what he was talking about. And if you read the paper, the, it's shocking, uh, given the con historical context of the time, what was really going on. I'm going to say some things here which may be a little, a little shocking. Um, he was actually under investigation at the time for being, uh, a, for being gay. Right. as you may know. Right. And today, of course, we wouldn't think twice about that. But back then, that was considered a crime. And so they would come and interview him to ask him questions about his life. And he had to try to persuade these interviewers, or he could have tried to persuade these interviewers, that, uh, that uh, he was actually uh, straight. And I'm sure that was in his mind, because if you read the actual paper, it starts off with a game in which a man on a teletype has to try to convince the, uh, the, an interviewer at the other end of the teletype that he is a woman. That was the original formulation. Oh, how interesting. Of, yes, that's the original formulation in that paper, which you just showed. Uh, and I recommend people read it. It'll take you 15 minutes. It's not technical. It's very interesting. He starts with that. And... The, there's a, a man and a woman on teletypes, and one of them is telling the truth, and the other one is lying. And the man is supposed to try to convince, fool the human interviewer to thinking he is the woman. That is the wow. original formulation of the Turing test. And then what he does is he says, now, what if we were to change that and make uh, the man a machine and try to see whether the machine could fool the interviewer into thinking he was a man? And that's the Turing test. So in that wow. context of the time, particularly what you can imagine what was in his mind because of what he was personally going through, yeah. that was the basis on which he was interested in whether a machine could appear to be intelligent just as he was being challenged to appear to be a, a man uh, uh, to mislead the interviewers about his sexual orientation holy cow actually this yeah. this is interesting because you're uh, as it seems to me throughout your life whenever you think about ai you're very aware of the political ramifications of it of the cultural ramifications of it it's so interesting to see how that influenced alan turing's thinking about what an intelligent machine might look like i i you know i remember talking to ray kurzweil about the singularity and uh, of course the idea that a computer at some point machines might be indistinguishable from humans and, and I've often wondered, and I've asked Ray this many times, well, but isn't there something ineffable, unique about a human that distinguishes it from anything a machine could do? And his answer is always the same. Well, but yeah, but if you can't tell, it doesn't matter. Well, I, I understand that's his point of view, and he's obviously a very smart guy, and I, I respect what he has to say. But I completely disagree with him. The fact that I can build a mechanical device made out of parts, out of a, a tool chest, that can fool somebody into thinking it's a person does not mean that it is a person. Now, there may be some ineffable quality, and I don't want to posit that without really having any evidence for it. But if you can, the, the difference is this, you may be able to fool somebody, but if you can open the thing up and see what's inside it and understand that it's, uh, let's just say a pile of circuits or something, then you understand that it is not a biological organism that is the result of millions of years of evolution. It's something else. It's a, uh, uh, what's the term? Is it sim simulacrum? A simulacrum, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, just, like the, just like the mechanical Turk. <laughs> well, it, well, that one was more human than, than, uh, than they thought. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. uh, but it's true. People have been building uh, uh, toys like uh, Sony's uh, Ibo. Ibo, you know, right, they, right. Uh, you know it, it's supposed to act like a dog. The more they can make it look and act like a dog, the better. And if it fools somebody into thinking it actually is a dog, if it got that good someday, uh, then I think you, you still could take it and smash it with a hammer and see what was inside it and understand that it didn't come through a natural biological process as the child of its parents. Uh, that's a, a very uh, different kind of thing. 
personally, I think this idea of the singularity is nonsense. And uh, it's based upon some fundamentally bad assumptions about the nature of intelligence and what the nature of the enterprise that we're engaged in. And so we're simply extrapolating that to out to infinity in a way that that really doesn't make sense. Well, so, I, it's always bugged me, but I've, but but at the same time, uh, I've never had a cogent argument against it, and I've never dared to argue against Ray Kurzweil anyway. But well, well, <laughs> but I'm glad you're of, saying this. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I always thought maybe it's the vanity of humans that we want to think of ourselves as having something. You could call it a soul. You could, I don't know what you would call it, but something that makes us distinct from anything a machine could ever do. Well. We are distinct in the following sense. Every one of us has a parent, and that parent has a parent, and we trace our way back to the beginning of life on Earth. And so that is a unique identity that we have that a machine can never have until you start doing a lot of hocus pocus and saying, well, I'm the parent of that machine. Well, I can build a toaster. I'm not the parent of the toaster. So. Uh, it's fundamentally different, even if it behaves exactly like us by design or it engages in behaviors that are exactly like us by design. But if I were arguing with Ray, which I have not had the opportunity to do, uh, I mean, the first question I would ask when he brought in this this uh, completely convincing simulation, uh, if you've been watching the TV show Westworld, yes. that's the latest yes. of these, yeah. you know, they're, they're they look obviously they use human actors. Uh, these are these are indistinguishable from from people. The first question I would ask is, what do you want for lunch? Uh -huh. And ask the question, how does a mechanical device that is built out of computing parts answer that question in a meaningful way? Because it doesn't have any feeling about what it would like. Uh, it it doesn't taste food in the sense that a human does, and so. It, there's no basis for it other than to make up an answer to that question. I love or that. as another I love that. another example, suppose you just take the clock speed and you ratchet it up by a factor of 10. Right. Now, what is it experiencing? It, do, 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 do you think we're, we've slowed down by a factor of 10? <laughs> um, if you were to, uh, if, I, if I, let me uh, riff on this for a minute. Um, suppose I wanted to uh, ask I wanted to play uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony for one of these devices. And what I did was every day I took uh, uh, one of the cycles, one of the bytes off of a CD uh, sound cycle of each each one of these, a little digital file, and I put it on a postcard and I mailed it off to this, this uh, hypothetical machine. And when I got done, the machine has now uh, conceived of, uh, it now has the entire file. And then I could say, well, how did you like it? Well, the problem is the machine, all it's seen is a bunch of bits, and it can't be experiencing that in the same way that we would, and particularly since it arrived, you know, one byte at a time over a couple of centuries or something. Uh, is it meaningful to say that a computer can enjoy or understand or experience something like Beethoven's Ninth in the way that a human can. So uh, I'm very skeptical about this whole notion of somehow anointing this new class of device as our successors in the world. And I think it's motivated more by kind of a wishful thinking and almost religious transcendental belief that maybe this is a way that we can achieve immortality yeah. when in fact, all we're doing is fooling ourselves by building machines that, like the Turing test, are presenting themselves as though they were human beings. We're talking to a Jerry Kaplan. He's a legend in Silicon Valley, the founder of uh, Go Corporation, an on-sale uh, serial entrepreneur. He uh, wrote Lotus Agenda, worked with Mitch Kapoor at uh, Lotus uh, in the early days. His new book, which is part of a, a series uh, I, from the Oxford University Press, which I think is a great idea for a series, What Everyone Needs to Know, uh, Jerry's Assignment, Artificial Intelligence. It's a quick read, but lots of references, lots of footnotes. So if you want to go deeper in any subject, you, tr you truly can. And I think it, you're starting to get the idea uh, that Jerry is a uniquely clear thinker on this subject and has a perspective that, frankly, we don't hear a lot uh, we talk about this all the time because it's kind of the hot topic these these days, especially on this show, um, and and a lot more. We, we we often we talk about you know 
the age of the coming age of machines and what we what our role as humans will be once the, our overlords arrive and all of that. I find what you're saying not only refreshing but reassuring, and I I think I agree with you. Although, uh, and again, Ray would say, well, it doesn't matter if it's a box of parts as long as it, you can't tell that if you know you can't tell that a Westworld robot is a robot then does it matter that it is a robot i want to well, get deeper into the philosophy we're gonna take a break jerry so i just sure. i want to get deeper into the philosophy of this can can com computers think uh is there such a thing as free will when you're talking about machinery things like that because you delve into in the book in that in the philosophy of artificial intelligence and that's something i find fascinating too we're going to have more in just a second with our guest jerry kaplan on triangulation our show today is brought to you by a name a familiar name uh corning and you're probably thinking, I know, I know that whenever I think of Corning, I think of two things. I think of the Corningware that I grew up with in the house, you know, the glassware. And then I also think of Gorilla Glass. They're very well known for Gorilla Glass. But in both cases, they're masters of glass. Really, Corning's biggest business these days is optical cables, fiber optics. And, of course, that's glass. That's glass in a unique uh, and very important way. Well, now you could take f Corning's fiber optical cables home with you and i love this these cables are thinner stronger lighter this are these are not your grandfather's fiber optics you can tie them in a knot you can step on them they're really robust and because it's fiber optics they have very long uh cable runs you can go up to 60 meters that's 200 feet on thunderbolt uh and this is uh this is the thunderbolt optical cable and you can go uh, 50 meters on usb3 which is, for a lot of reasons, really great. For instance, nowadays we all have very silent computers. Many of our computers don't have fans. They don't have spinning drives. And yet you may want massive storage. And that can be making some noise, but now you could put it somewhere else. Uh, this is really a big issue in, uh, in recording studios. For instance, um, one of the users of these cables is Tonzaber Studio. It's in Austria. They use the USB 3.0 optical cables uh, because they're doing live performances. And they need a very quiet recording space for those live performances. So all those noisy devices, they put outside the studio. And, of course, because they're Corning Optical, they can be used at a great distance with no signal loss at all. The magic is in the connector on the cable. It's kind of cool because, uh, of course, if you think about it, Thunderbolt, as it comes on your PC, or uh, USB, as it comes on your PC, is copper, right? How do you make it? glass well these little tiny connectors at both ends take the signal from the copper the standard signal your computer doesn't know the difference convert it to light and then send it down this cable where at the other end of course there's a receiver that does the same thing on the other end it is remarkable and corning is using its glass brilliance to make stuff that is super reliable super strong super flexible you can kink it you can tie it in a knot and, uh, and it just keeps on working. You can even walk on it. I remember when we first started using fiber optic cables in the studio. They're bright orange, and, and my staff said, whatever you do, Leo, don't touch them. Don't walk on them. But no, these things, they take a bending, and they just keep on sending. So instead of investing in multiple extenders and adapters and cables, turn to optical cables by Corning to make the connection you need with one simple, long, thin, light, flexible cable. Optical cables by Corning available at all major electronics and professional AV retailers, including Apple stores, Amazon, B&H, and more. Optical cables by Corning, longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to opticalcablesbycorning.com to learn more. These are awesome. I use them everywhere. In fact, I can't keep these in studio. We have the, you know, we have the demo cables. I can't keep them in studio. <laughs> Somehow they keep disappearing, and I must admit, I have to admit, I have a few at home that I've I've borrowed. I've just borrowed them. Long-term borrow from the studio. Thank you, Corning, for your support of Triangulation. Our guest is uh, Jerry Kaplan. This is fun. I'm, uh, you know, I'm thrilled to meet you, of course. I always wanted a Go computer. Uh, you really uh, can be credited uh, with, with when you started Go with being the first to do a tablet computing. Uh, in fact, almost like smartphones too, right? I mean, this is... What year did you found Go? 1987, we founded Go. Wow. And, and was it, was it just... AT &T. Yeah, at and bought it. Yeah, it was about 1993. Was it was it, the basis of some products that they were putting together, which ultimately they decided to kill the product line, unfortunately. Yeah. Was yeah. it ahead of its time? Um, yes and no. 
uh, it was ahead if you compare it, of course, to uh, today's uh, computers. Uh, because a lot of the concepts and ideas that you see, for example, in the uh, Apple iPad, right. really uh, were originated in the uh, the Go operating system, which was called PenPoint. On the other hand, uh, it actually could do a lot of very useful and valuable things in the context of the time. This was pre-internet, I might point out. So, uh, But it, it still had uh, potential value, and there were a lot of customers. It was actually in use by customers up through about 2007, I no think. No kidding. So my last, uh, yeah, the last one that finally gave it up and went over to a, to a different type of uh, tablet computer. Did you, uh, you had a phone as well? Yes, uh, it was also the basis for a, what arguably is the first smartphone. It was the uh, EO440. The uh, EO, I, I remember the EO. I thought we were going to talk about it. I would have brought my, my prototypes that I can hold up, my little gadgets. Um, but it was, uh, a, it was a small tablet, I would say. Let me put this in your frame. Uh, maybe about that big, uh, about like Yo. And uh, you basically could work on it with a pen. Uh, at the time, they didn't have good touch technology. But it had a phone built in. And you could make phone calls and tap out the, the numbers that you wanted or send faxes or uh, look at your calendar and a whole variety of other activities that I think you'd find very comfortable today. It was an AT&T uh, processor, so I guess that's why uh, AT&T got involved. It had, mm -hmm. I have a picture here, Karsten, on the screen. It had ears. <laughs> yes, it did. I noticed that. Uh, it had ears. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's hysterical. I guess we, I'm, I'm trying to get this up on the screen. Anyway, uh, it's, it, Silicon Valley is littered sadly, uh, with technologies like these that just for whatever reason, they were too early, that maybe the hardware wasn't there. Uh, had you had, you know, 3G and LTE connectivity, that might have made a huge difference to a device like this. But there it is. There it is, yeah. Uh, you know, thank goodness, uh, because, you know, somebody has to do this and so that we can start the iterations. That's correct. Somebody has to find the Northwest Passage, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Ice break through. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, thank you for doing that. We're talking about uh, Jerry's latest uh, book. By the way, if you want to read about the ghost story, Startup covers that. That's your, correct. Yeah, your first book. And it's a classic. It's a must read uh, for Sil thank Silicon you. Valley history. Yeah. Uh, this, this one is the latest. It's called Artificial Intelligence, What Everyone Needs to Know. Uh, simple, easy to understand. But, but as is often the case, uh, it's only simple because you have the deep understanding of the subject from years of experience in the area. Um, and, and, you know, so many of us try to explain AI without that background. And I think uh, I'm really glad we could get you on to talk about this. So let's let, let's get to the philosophy of uh, AI. I think we've distinguished now between the science fiction, the Terminator AI, the Matrix AI. We've 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 gone past that. We understand that today we live in a world of specialized. I almost don't. Is there a better term than AI is machine learning? That's what Google seems to like better. Well, that's because machine learning is referring to a very specific set of collection of techniques that are being used today to solve a series of problems that previously were difficult to solve using other AI techniques. So it's a subfield of artificial I intelligence. I see. But all of it is an attempt to, well, what, what is our goal with AI? If we can't make a machine behave like a human, what is our goal? Well, this is a very good question. When we characterize it as an attempt to recreate intelligence in a machine, that's a little bit like saying that um, the the chemists, the alchemists of the Middle Ages uh, are trying to uh, turn lead into gold. Now, they never succeeded in turning lead into gold, but they did a lot of good chemistry. And what we see today is oh, maybe people want to think about they're making intelligent machines, but they are doing a lot of very valuable work, uh, for example, on speech recognition, automatic translation between languages. I mean, these are real advances, but they're based on machine learning is essentially a collection of tools for finding subtle patterns in extremely large collections yeah. of data. And when you understand that that's what it's about, and the fact that we have so much data in electronic form today, this is the right tool at the right time for solving all kinds of useful problems. So many problems that you think are actually different really are quite similar in that they involve the analysis of very large uh, volumes or collections of data and extracting out of them patterns that let you 
interpret that data or to use it to solve problems that we couldn't solve before. So for example, there are many advances in image recognition. We can now, uh, Google and others, can look at a picture and say, there's a cat in the picture and two people in the picture. Well, in order to do that, how is it done? It's not that they have a model of what a cat is and they have a model of what people look like. That's the old version of AI. Well, instead, what they do is they feed in literally millions of pictures that may be labeled, or in some cases they're not, but that's a little more subtle and complicated story of unsupervised learning. And out of that, they can extract some patterns. So they can say, if, if, you, if we see this pattern in this new picture, which is different than this collection of millions of old pictures, we believe that that picture contains a person. Furthermore, it is located at this point in the picture. So they can identify the location of those particular kinds of objects. So that's one example of the use of machine learning. But machine learning isn't like human learning. Because if you think about how you teach a, a, a child to recognize a cat, you point one out, you go, that's a cat. They go, oh, wow, oh, <laughs> now I know what a cat is. You need one image, one example. Right. But uh, you need millions to do this using machine learning techniques. This doesn't mean that those techniques are inferior. They're just very different than right. the, way, the way people do it. We often uh, point to the fact that a four-year-old can recognize uh, its mother's face in a way that uh, seems much more adept than any computer ha can be. Sometimes people just say, well, we're just beginning. Uh, we're going to get there. Are we going to get to the point where uh, this kind of, whether it's through machine learning or other techniques, uh, th these kinds of devices can be as at least as intelligent as a five-year-old? Well, where I given this a lot of thought and studied what people have said about it, the problem is the notion that five-year-olds have intelligence. <laughs> that may sound funny, but I would say the same thing about you and me. Um, we have this notion of intelligence as some kind of linear scale, which can be measured, that it's an objective real quality, like, like mass or your shoe size. But the truth is that intelligence is not a coherent concept in and of itself. Uh, we see it that way or we view it that way, but there's no evidence for it. The truth is that you have certain capabilities and certain things that you can do, and we consider some of them to be signs of greater intelligence than others. So, But there is no linear scale, and the main problem that's come up is that people think of the IQ as a measure of yeah. intelligence. And it, intelligence is... The IQ is not a measure of intelligence, as a psychologist will tell you. It's a measure of what's called developmental competence. And IQ means intelligent quotient. A quotient is a, a uh, uh, ratio or a divisor. And what they do when they measure intelligence is they see what your capabilities are, and then they measure that against people at different ages. At what age are people able to in, uh, solve those kinds of problems or learn those kinds of techniques? So it's basically a question of, hey, you've got a five-year-old who can do math as well as the average seven-year-old, so their IQ is X. Now, if you think about that, it's not meaningful once you're an adult to talk about measuring your intelligence. So this whole notion of Mensa-like notion that I have an intelligence of 150 or my, my IQ is 120, it's all nonsense. And anybody who's smart enough and read the stuff would know that that's ridiculous. So what does it mean when I have a calculator right here that can do math uh, better and more accurately uh, than the uh, smartest human on earth? Uh, does that mean that the calculator has an IQ of a million? <laughs> of course not, it's silly. So the whole notion of super intelligence, which is based on this mythology that there's a linear scale of intelligence, which is objective and measurable is false. And that's one of the reasons why I think our whole notion and worry about the singularity is is kind of uh, silly. We don't really even understand what a human intelligence is, in other words, let alone what a machine intelligence might be. I, I agree. Uh, intelligence, it's a, it's a subjective quantity. I'm not saying some people aren't smarter than others, but it's a little bit like measuring beauty. Uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. And what it meant to be intelligent when we were out in the woods chasing uh wild animals to kill for our food, what made you intelligent or, or meant you had good skills is very different than, than what it means today. 
so just as beauty might be different in Karachi or in uh, somewhere in Africa, uh, I guess that is in Africa, excuse me. No, I'm sorry, uh, Pakistan and uh, uh, Nairobi, there we go. Um, then th that beauty might be something very different there. Intelligence may mean something different in different places. Wow. Psychologists talk about uh, social and emotional intelligence, athletic intelligence, uh, mechanical intelligence. These are all different concepts. So you're right in what you said. I don't think that the concept of human intelligence is a meaningful or well-defined. And when we try to apply it in a kind of mechanistic way to electronic devices, that's not meaningful either. It's kind of what uh, Jeff Hawkins uh, is trying to do with Numenta. He, uh, we've interviewed Jeff on this show about uh, his sure. book on intelligence, which is a great read. Um, mm -hmm. He says, well, if you're going to make an intelligent machine, you can't make it in a kind of von Neumann architecture. You have to do something that is more, much more massively parallel like our own mind. Uh, but yet that under, that implies that we somehow understand how we are intelligent and how it works, and we can apply that to a machine, all of which seems, f from what you've just said, uh, far-fetched. Well, it, it is. Now, now, Jeff is one of the very few people who I think can make a legitimate claim to saying he's doing what you might call biologically inspired computing. Right. Because he is literally trying to understand by analyzing our brains, what the actual neurological processes are. And then he's simulating those in a machine, hoping that by building networks of these things, they will be able to solve similar kinds of problems to those you can do with your, I think, prefrontal cortex, which are kind of your reasoning uh, and uh, pattern recognition centers. Now that doesn't mean he's building a human being. Uh, it's not something that gets hungry at night or falls in love. That's not what Jeff would say and not really where he's going. But if anybody has a right to use a term like artificial intelligence, I think that Jeff is probably at the top of the heap. Yeah. The rest of this stuff is really en engineering practice. So, Leo, if I could come back to something that you said, sometimes I feel like the atheist at an evangelical convention. Uh, <laughs> if I walked in there and said, there, "This is the new there, spirituality, isn't it?" <laughs> exactly. You know, there is no, there is no God, and uh, you know, Jesus Christ was a man. They'd say, "Well, thank you very much. That's very nice. Go home. Go by. Go by." <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, um, I, it, it, you don't get a lot of uh, attention for claiming that the emperor has no clothes. Uh, those who want to talk about this is all very spiritual and we're building godlike machines and we'll be able to upload ourselves. I don't even know what the hell that means yeah. into a machine. Yeah. Uh, good. We'll call it grandpa in a can is what I call this in my <laughs> book. You know, you'll go, hey, grandpa's on the mantelpiece. Let's go ask grandpa a question. You know, well, grandpa's not going to be taking you out for ice cream. Uh, and if it did, it's just some kind of weird mechanical device. It's not grandpa. Grandpa's dead. Yeah. Get used to yeah. it. <laughs> it's just something acting like grandpa. Uh, exactly. Well, and so this all jibes perfectly with what we've observed so far. You talked about the Go playing machine. We've seen uh, machines beat humans at chess. We now can say probably computers are better than uh, humans at Go or will be soon. And yet that is a very deterministic uh, uh, problem set. It is not thinking uh, in any sense that I think we understand. Um, and, and yet it's held up as an example of how far we've come. Uh, are you saying that what we think of as AI, what you talk about as AI in, uh, in this book, really is, it can just boil down to things like pattern recognition, uh, quick database uh, analysis, things like that? Uh, well, the, the are we going to go beyond answer, that? The one word answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, now we can wave our arms and say someday yeah. we might have machines. But that, there's this leap that nobody can define to get to that point. That's right. I mean, my view, it's like I woke up one day as I was researching actually my previous book and I said, wait a minute, we've been talking about this for 50 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew that I knew John McCarthy. That's yeah. how old I am. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and I understand his point of view, which by the way, today is, is widely discredited as to what the basis of intelligence really is. Um, and, the fact is, what's really going on in the field, if you talk to people who go to go to Google and talk to the real engineers, 
they'll go, well, I don't know, maybe the guy in the next room's building something that's intelligent, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm figuring out a way to recognize pictures of cats. Right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm applying whatever the tools and techniques. So, yes, we're making progress. The question is progress toward what? My view is this is all about automation. Yeah. We're solving problems that we previously couldn't automate, just in the same way that the Jacquard loom in the mm. late 1700s solved the problem of people having to sit there and do needlework. Right. So uh, I just see it as a natural extension of the history of automation. And the idea that we're somehow summoning the demon is uh, there's no evidence for it. Very reassuring. So the, so the car that can drive itself isn't grandpa. That's just a car <laughs> that, can, that can drive itself. Nothing magic Absolutely. happening there. Well, I, I've, a, a friend of mine, uh, Brad Templeton, I give him credit. He had a great line when he was asked about this that really illustrates this difference between the public perception of these words and what's going on in the field. He said, your car will be truly autonomous when you instruct it to take you to the office and it decides to go to the beach instead. <laughs> that so sounds like think, a bug, not a feature. <laughs> exactly. But we think today about, you know, self-driving cars right. as, oh, my God, they can see the pedestrians and they're making decisions. But that's not an accurate no. view of what's really going on. Yeah. What an engineer means by autonomous is that we have sensors in the environment, we can take in the data, and we can write programs that can uh, instruct uh, the actuators in the car to engage in uh, acceptable behavior in public spaces. That's what autonomous means. So uh, it's very important that we understand this, um, that it's not that the cars are getting smarter, it's that we now have tools that allow us to uh, interpret radar and images in ways that we can um, take action on in order to cause a car to do the things that we want it to do. So is it nonsense then to ask the question, you, you talk about this in the, in the book, uh, whether a computer can think, whether a computer can have free will, whether a computer can be conscious. Are, conscious. are those nonsense questions? Well, the questions aren't nonsense, but uh, I think you really have to dig down and, and look at what these things really mean. Philosophers have struggled for millennia over the question of what it means to have free will. In my opinion, one of the best contemporary uh, speakers, very accessible, and his writing is very accessible, is uh, Sam Harris. I don't know if you've uh, seen his work. I don't know. On free will. Uh, it's a really, really fascinating a book called uh, Free Will. Uh, he's got another one called Letter to a Christian Nation that's uh, outstanding. Um, uh, the... Basically, he makes the argument that the concept of human free will is not compatible with our current scientific worldview. And I have to agree with him. We don't understand what free will is or whether it really exists in human beings, or is it simply an illusion or something we would like to uh, believe? There we go. Boy, you guys are really fast. At I got a good They're producer. Yeah. yeah. Producers really, really, and in fact, Karsten, let's book this guy. I want to. Sam has a oh. podcast as well. Uh, I would yes, love, yeah, I would love to get him on. All right. So uh, he he uh, debunks it, and I I have different arguments in different ways in my book, but I basically take this same point of view. Um, I come out with the following interesting conclusion: If people have free will, it is true that machines can have free will as well. But I don't know whether people have free will. I can't answer the question whether both do or both don't. But there's no reason in principle to distinguish between the free will of a human being and the free will of a machine without resorting to what I might call spiritual yeah. fundamental beliefs. And yet that's what scares us. The notion that a machine can go beyond what we've specifically told it to do in a program, as in a self-driving car, to deciding what it wants for lunch. That's what scares humans. That does scare humans. And there's absolutely no reason to think that uh, that, that is going to happen in the way that it's presented uh, in the, the media. Oh, uh, we talked We <laughs> talked about uh, the current TV show that's on Westworld. Uh, Westworld. Yeah, yeah. That's a great example. There's a long history of these. It was another one called Humans, mm -hmm. uh, Endless Stories. And they always have the same basic idea. We built these machines, and now they're becoming conscious. Well, we don't know what consciousness is. And what we really mean by that is, do they deserve the courtesy 
of our empathy. Ah. Do they have rights? Do, should we be treating them as though they have feelings and rights? And there's wonderful work on, on uh, uh, animal uh, rights that really applies to this uh, by uh, uh, Peter Singer. And the same thing goes with machines. Now, in the case of animals, there's at least some basis for thinking that they have conscious experience, potentially, and have real feelings, and that they can feel pain. And so we, as living organisms, have some kind of uh, moral obligation to animals and to other people. But there's no reason to believe that a machine should be brought into that circle of living things or humanity. No matter how much it screams and says, I am hungry, I, you know, I, I want to go to sleep, you, know, you can build something that does that, but it doesn't mean that it's actually having feelings. And I think those things, contrary to what Kurzweil might say, they're easily distinguishable, even though that behavior might, might be very similar to a, to a human being. I so we, sorry, we, we, we confuse complexity uh, with this some kind of magical transformation into free will or consciousness or, or, uh, or thinking. But and, and I you even see it today with a computer. I think I uh, you see people a lot of times say, "Well, I, this computer is haunted." It's because it's not doesn't seem like it's acting as a deterministic system. And yet we know, you know, if we think about it, that it is absolutely deterministic. That there's no magic happening inside there. Uh, do you think that that that's a continuum? There isn't going to be some fairy dust we can sprinkle on these machines to to take them to that next level. Well, this is a very interesting and subtle point. Since you have a technical audience, I will do this in a way that I wouldn't do with the general audience. Right. Um, there's a question of Turing computability. And what the result of this really fascinating mathematical concept is, is that there are things that are true and there are that are deterministic in the sense that you, you are thinking about them, that you can predict exactly what is going to happen. Uh, well, I'm sorry, that's contrary to what point I'm about to make, that, that one state flows absolutely from the previous state. Fully causal. And, yes, fully causal. Thank you. That's much better. But that does not mean that you can predict what it will do in advance. And this is a really fascinating uh, uh, concept that I cover in the book and give some examples uh, about how a robot may be fully deterministic in that sense, but yet it is in principle impossible under very specific circumstances to be able to say, well, therefore we can predict what it will do because you can't predict what it will do. Uh, this goes back to some very fundamental ideas about the nature of computation and the, the uh, classes of devices that we're building. So I, if I, I can suggest, if you're interested in this, take a look in the book on the areas of consciousness and free will. And I give examples that I think explain uh, how our notion of determinism as it might apply to a machine versus to a human being is fundamentally flawed. And we still don't know if that cat is dead or not in that box. That is true. Is it chaos theory? Is it, uh, is it, is it quantum mechanics? What it, why don't we know? Why can't we... I always feel like, well, we just don't have enough information. If we had full information, we'd know exactly what that machine was going to choose. Well, I, I, this is a, a little too subtle, I think, to be able to explain in, in the course of our, our conversation. But I use an example in my book that I've created of, imagine a robot that's sitting in a room and the people who created it are behind a glass wall. And they are going to, they know, they have an absolutely perfect simulation of that robot. And they are going to decide, uh, they're going to tell you whether that robot is going to pick uh, uh, red or blue. You're going to say something to the robot, you're going to say pick red or blue, and they're going to be able to simulate whether or not it is actually going to pick red or blue. But unbeknownst to them, the robot can hear what they're saying. Mm. So they run their simulation. And they say, well, a simulation says the robot's going to pick blue. Robot can hear them. Now, the robot's perfectly capable of saying, okay, I'm just going to pick red because they said blue. Now, this is where our intuition breaks down. The robot itself is entirely deterministic. But the truth is it can make a decision, if you will, that is completely unpredictable. Because if you could predict it, it can do the opposite. 
And so this is the yeah, essence. But why of, would it do it? That imputes some sort of free will to the to the robot. No, it's perfectly determined. I'll do the same thing with you. Uh, we put you in a room, yeah. and uh, you, you may not be may not think of yourself as deterministic, but we're going to agree in advance. If I predict red, you're going to say blue. Oh, that's that, deterministic. That, sure, that's deterministic. Yeah, but deterministic. but that was a lack of information on the part of the researchers because if they had known about that programming and they had known that the computer could hear them, they would have absolutely been able to predict the outcome. No, I I don't believe that's the case because it can hear them and they have to they have to make a prediction. They have to say, okay, here's our prediction. Yeah. So once they make that prediction, the robot can do the opposite. That's entirely deterministic, and what that means is in principle. You can't make a, a correct prediction about this deterministic uh, robot in this circumstance. That's a very subtle thing, and I cover it in the book, but it, it's very hard to get your head around. It's contrary to your intuition. It's like, the, so, it's like a class paradox, kind of. It, it, exactly. It's a form yeah. of paradox, yeah. but it's based upon some very uh, fascinating and deep mathematics uh, that uh, actually is attributable to Alan Turing. Uh, to talk about uh, the nature of Turing, com uh, Turing computability. And um, I, I, I've tried to bring it down to people in a way that they can understand it through this example of the robot in, in the room. But it does mean that deterministic does not mean predictable. Yeah. That's why this is a great book. Um, Thank you. Despite the thin appearance, in fact, it be <laughs> maybe because of the thin appearance, it is really cuts to the... Cuts to the point. Uh, Jerry Kaplan is our guest. His book, Artificial Intelligence, is part of Oxford University's Press What Everyone Needs to Know series. But don't that doesn't mean that it's dumbed down in any way. And in fact, because of all your footnotes and references, uh, people could go as deep as they want. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. We're going to take a break. Uh, come back with more with our guest, uh, Jerry Kaplan, in just a moment. Our show today brought to you by Epson. Epson, I love this. I, yeah, no one could have predicted this. This is called non-deterministic behavior. Uh, who would have thought a printer manufacturer would suddenly say, you know, let's just let's just forget the markup on uh, on ink and on cartridges. Let's let's just let's just do the right thing for our users. And they created the EcoTank printer. And thank you, Epson. Epson's EcoTank printer is a new uh, category of wireless all-in-one printers that doesn't use ink cartridges it has an amazing innovative refillable ink tank right on the side of it that's why it won the innovation awards honor at ces this year no more out of ink frustration and when you buy an epson eco tank printer we just bought the et4550 which we love it comes with two years of ink in the box so those little bottles, I just filled up the tank, and now I'm going to be able to print 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. When I go buy ink in 2018, I'll save up to 80% with low-cost replacement bottles. This is what you've been looking for. No more running out of ink in the middle of a job. And by the way, these are great printers. The 4550 is based on the Precision Core printing technology. Epson brought it down from their big industrial printers. 40 million nano droplets a second for crisp black and white printing, vivid colors, and, of course, all the benefits of inkjet printing, like automatic two-sided printing, no warm-up warm -up time. They've got Epson's really, I don't know what they did, but they've perfected the sheet feeder. If you've ever used auto-document feeders, you're probably like me going, oh, I'm not going to try that again. Let me tell you, these uh, uh, auto-document feeders really work, and this and their new fast photo scanner, they figured it out. I don't know what they did, but they have got it down, and perfect every time. It'll save you so much time. And, of course, it's wireless, so you can print from your tablet or your phone as easily as you can from your computer. The Epson EcoTank, 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. Epson's getting tons of awards and, and pats on the back for doing the right thing for customers. I love them. I want you to find out more at the Epson EcoTank site. It's Epson, E-P-S-O-N, dot com slash EcoTank. Transform the way your home, your office, your work group prints. And, you know, stop running out to Staples to get a cartridge in the in the middle. You know what I would always do is I'd order lots of extra ones. Not anymore. Don't have to worry. 11,000 black, 8,500 color pages. I'm going to be good till 2018 on my ET4550. Love that printer. You will too. Epson, exceed your vision. We're talking to Jerry Kaplan, the only person I know who has a Wayne Tebow portrait. Even better, you and your sister Amy, 
Children of the oh '60s. God. That is a oh, great picture. God. Where does that? Where does that? Uh, I mean, that must be worth un priceless from Wayne Tebow. Where does that? Do you have it? Ah, uh, well, I don't want to get it stolen, so I'm not. Gonna Nobody give you has it. It doesn't exist. But Pay no, but it does, let's just say my mother uh, has custody of uh, of that. Uh, she commissioned it. She did, actually, yes. 1964. That is better than any family photo I've ever seen. That is awesome. Yeah, I also, it's quite remarkable, yeah. Yeah. I also have to thank you uh, for Q&A. So for years, I used the best, and I was sad when you know I could, couldn't use it anymore, the best database I ever used from Symantec called q and it was, it was just easy to use. It did everything I wanted. And uh, this guy wrote it when he was at Stanford. Well, well Leo, I, I, I don't want to exaggerate my role in this. I, I did an early prototype. I worked with, uh, it was Gary Hendricks and... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, his name has just escaped me. This is the problem when you get old. The first thing that goes are names. Not Gordon names. Eubanks. No, it wasn't. Gordon bought the company later, later. and they okay. did Q&A. I, I, I cannot... So it was the prototype for Q&A. That's right. I wrote okay. the database back end that uh, Norm Haas and Gary Hendricks did the front end, and we took that to uh, uh, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield & Byers, and John Doerr, who was a partner there, young guy at the time, uh, you know, financed uh, finance that uh, company. So I can say that I was a founder. I had founding stock in uh, Symantec, but it was an early version of Symantec, not the version that you you yeah, know today. That was Gordon's Symantec, which is frankly my favorite my favorite flavor of Symantec. Yeah, Gordon's a wonderful guy. I love Gordon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but what I didn't also didn't know uh, is that all along uh, there's been this thread through all of your work, all of your startups of artificial intelligence. But what's great is you don't have this mystical vision of artificial intelligence that we are hearing again over and over everywhere we go. Now, did you watch October 4th, uh, the Google product announcement? Sundar Pichai talked about artificial intelligence as being the fourth major revolution in uh, computing, the personal computer, uh, the, the what was it? The personal computer, the internet, mobile computing, and now AI. Does that resonate with you or is that asking too much of this technology um i first of all uh, just a full disclosure i did not see this announcement that you're referring to but um well you can trust me i've 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 characterized it perfectly okay well the <laughs> the problem is the name artificial intelligence yeah. implies something for people that is far beyond what's really going on if it had been named something more uh, pedestrian like symbolic computing uh, I don't think we'd be talking about it in the same way in, on television today. Right. I, I think that artificial intelligence is not like the Internet or it's not like uh, personal computers in that you will not buy it in the future. It's a series of techniques, mostly software techniques, that are used in the creation of other kinds of products. So in this sense, it's like linear programming. If you were to talk about linear programming, nobody's going to say, the next great wave in computer science <laughs> what is going to be linear programming, even right. though linear programming made a huge difference and made a whole set of problems solvable. This is way back when. Uh, th what you're interested in are the applications of it. So I think what the right thing to say by Google and other companies is that we've got this great new hammer, and now we're going around and we're swatting everything to see where we can use that hammer. We can use it to give better recommendations. We can use it to recognize whether your friends are in pictures. We can use it to build self-driving cars. We can use it to improve medical diagnosis. Uh, we can use it to uh, build machines that can sense their environment adequately. They can do things like uh, uh, grow and plant and pick crops. Uh, this is all true. But the things that people will see will be all of these different uh, tech, not the technology, but all these different products and applications of that technology. So that brings us to the last couple of chapters in the book, Artificial Intelligence, and also the book, your previous uh, book. And, and I think if you call it automation, uh, yes. that maybe help us under how, understand how it's going to change uh, our world going forward. What does this mean for jobs? What does this mean for human beings? How is our world going to change because of, what, let's not call it AI, but because of this new technology, this new hammer? Well, it's going to accelerate the rate at which we 
uh, can automate tasks that currently people have to do. And in plain English, that means a lot of people are going to be out of jobs. And so that is transformation of the labor force has always occurred. And we have always responded to it by finding new kinds of jobs. And employment has always increased, despite the warnings at, at various apocalyptic times in the past that, you know, by the year 2000, nobody will have to work anymore. Um, <laughs> have to, so, uh, yet may want to. <laughs> that's exactly, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, the labor force is constantly evolved and constantly changed. But that's not to say there isn't significant disruption. So that a lot of people on a personal basis are hurt by that kind yes. of disruption. We're seeing the same thing today with uh, the hollowing out of, uh, we saw it, I should say, in the past couple of decades, the hollowing out of American manufacturing. Well, if you think that it's a God-given law that we need to be manufacturing everything here in the US, then you think this is a terrible thing. But the truth is the jobs went elsewhere, the tasks went elsewhere, the jobs elsewhere, by the way, are now disappearing because automation is taking over. And the real problem is what to do with the people whose only skills were how to, how to mine coal. What we're not doing is paying attention, enough attention, to having to retrain them and how to make them part of society in, in valuable ways so that they can lead productive and, and reasonable lives. So uh, artificial intelligence has the potential to do two things that we need to watch out for. The first is by accelerating the rate of automation we're going to be putting people out of jobs and we need to pay attention to how to retrain those people or to make sure that they don't fall off of the uh, economic ladder that everybody else is on. The second is automation also tends to increase income inequality because automation is the application of capital, the substitution of capital for labor. And that means that the people who uh, can afford to build those machines and own those machines are the ones who benefit from the newfound wealth that those machines create. And the people whose main asset is their own labor, their work is devalued and they don't participate in the increasing value that is created. So those are two forces that I would call uh, antisocial. They're, they're, it's where our technology is not really aligned with the kind of social goals that we have. And so uh, those are things that we really need to pay attention to. And I cover those in more detail in my previous book, Humans Need Not Apply, A Guide to Wealth and Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Oh, thank you. And I know you, you, you give a lot of uh, talks, and you have three talks. You have one for the businesses and how their business is going to change, one for a general audience to reassure them. Uh, but also you speak to policymakers. Uh, yes. January 20th, we're going to have a new president. Uh, what uh, is there a way forward uh, for uh, our country uh, in in the light of what is clearly going to be uh, really disruptive? Um, well, yes, there's absolutely a way forward. The first thing you got to understand is start with the good news. The reason we automate these tasks is not because it drags down our economy, but because it creates more wealth. So on average, we're getting wealthier. The question is, who is going to get the benefits of that wealth? And that's a social policy issue. And that's what the government should be doing, worrying about those things, does do. And that's what it's all about. So the government, for example, created Social Security. I think that's had tremendously, <clears throat> excuse me, positive effects for society. Uh, and we may need more programs like that that uh, permit us to redistribute the new wealth in ways that we think is fair and just for all of society. We've got a challenge ahead, but uh, I think it starts by understanding what uh, machines can and cannot do and what the impact is going to be on our future. And I'm really thrilled to talk to you because clearly uh, you're not coming from this mystical, magical point of view, but from a really truly pragmatic, practical, and frankly, sensible uh, point of view. The book is Artificial Intelligence, What Everyone Needs to Know. Jerry Kaplan, thank you so much for joining us on Triangulation today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Leo. I really appreciate the chance to talk to your audience. Thanks. We do triangulation uh, every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you'd like to join us, uh, 
We'd love to have you live because the chat room is a big contributor on this show at irc.twit.tv. But don't worry, on demand, audio and video of everything we do at Twit is available, both on our website, in this case, twit.tv slash TRI, uh, but also, of course, wherever you subscribe to uh, your favorite internet shows, iTunes, uh, Google, uh, all music, and Stitcher and Slacker, and you know all of those programs that you can put on your mobile device. Make sure you subscribe to Triangulation. I think it's the kind of thing you get up on a Monday and uh, and get and, and maybe or a Tuesday and go to work and say, "Oh, I'm glad I got a new Triangulation." Always interesting. Lots of great shows ahead for you. Thanks for joining us, and I will see you next time on Triangulation. Bye. -bye.